Amen. So we are now in the 16th chapter of the book of Luke. What a journey it's been through this book of Luke. The 16th chapter, and I'm going to try to cover the entire chapter in one fell swoop. One of the things that we, we know and we understand, there are two things that corrupt, right? Power and money. Power and money. Those are the two things that we absolutely know will corrupt people. Uh, we've seen, because of money, we've seen families destroyed. We've seen relationships destroyed. Uh, people completely change their attitudes and, and their things. Uh, we've seen it affect not only people and families, we've seen it affecting institutions, the church, Christians. So, so money is a, a kind of a barometer, if you will. It's a, it's a thermostat. The, uh, the reason why I believe Jesus spoke so much about money, as we've gone through the book of Luke, we've hit this topic already several times. And remember that the Bible says that where your, where your heart is, right? And where your treasure is, those two are synonymous. They're, they're together. You can tell where someone's heart is based upon where their treasure is, what is most important. And it's easy to talk about money in one sense, but, but it reveals something about us. Amen? It truly does. And so we've heard and we've seen how Jesus spoke a lot about being generous, and we as believers in Christ, as Christ followers, uh, we are commanded to be a generous people. Here, it's an interesting chapter. Uh, remember, I've always struggled with this parable of the shrewd manager. Here, Jesus is, begins to talk to his disciples. So now, remember, the disciples have been with him now for three years. He's getting ready. He's getting closer to Jerusalem. He's getting closer to the, to the time of his death. He knows this, understands that. And so, every time he... He teaches his disciples it's it's important right the most important things as you get closer to knowing you're going to be gone you want to make sure you drive it in and so now it says that Jesus again talking to his disciples says you know there was this rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions remember so you you've got this money manager or this steward as we call it right and the the owner of the property of the assets, if you will, accuses him of wasting his possessions. And so he called him and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. So he had heard, I guess, maybe other people in the circle sort of saying, hey, this guy is wasting your money. This guy is cheating you. He's being irresponsible. And so there's this moment where he says, okay, guess what? It's time for you to give an account. And I think that's one of the things we want to keep in mind as we go through this chapter, and especially this story, that we will all give an account. There are two judgments in the Bible. There is the white throne judgment where non-believers will be judged for their sins. There's also the judgment seat of Christ. And in the judgment seat of Christ, believers will give an account for what they have done since Christ came into your life. You're not being judged for your sins. Christ died on the cross for your sins. Those sins have been paid for. But we have a responsibility. We are stewards of everything that God gives us. And this parable is about that fact that you and I will give an account at some point before the very judgment seat of Christ of how well we manage what God has given us. Whether it's our time, our talents, whether it's our money, our intelligence, the things that God has given us, the skills, 
What have we done with what God has given us? Our health? What have we done with what God has given us to enhance, to increase, to promote, to move forward the very kingdom of God? We will give an account. And so the master, what's interesting is that when the servant, the steward, hears about this, right? He decides to go by. He's thinking, okay, what am I going to do? Now I'm going to be unemployed. He's going to fire me. What am I going to do? I mean, I'm, I, you know, I, I live a good life right now. I make a lot of money. Now I'm going to be broke. No one else is going to hire me when they hear what happened. Uh, what am I going to do? And so he thinks, oh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to make some friends, right? I'm going to make some connections so that when, when I get unemployed, there's going to be a group of people that kind of owe me. So what he does is he goes to one that owes the master a large, and these are large. When I looked up the, the quantities, these were large amounts, okay, huge amounts. And he says to the one, listen, you owe so much, you know what, take off 50% and I'll sign off on it. And he went to another one and said, look, you owe this much, take 20% off the top. And I'll sign off on it. His thinking is, okay, these people now are going to owe me in a way because, number one, I did them a favor, right? I did them a solid. Their bill went down. But secondly, they're in on it, <laughs> right? Now I've got something over them because they're in on the deal here. They knew I was cutting them off. Now, I was thinking, okay, wouldn't the, the, the owner realize this? Well, a lot of the scholars were saying that basically what this guy did was he took off his commission. Every one of these bills that he managed was on commission. That's the way he made money. So he would put so much on top of what the owners had, and that was the bill. And so what many of them were thinking is that what he did was shrewdly, right, he took off all of his commissions off the people and they felt like, well, it's a good deal for me. I, you know, it's lowered my bill. And again, you know. And so it was interesting because when I read this in verse 8, right, it says, so the master, when he comes back and he found out what the guy did, you know, I'm thinking, oh, this guy's going to be all upset or mad or, you know what I mean, condemn him. The master commended him, commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. He's like, dude, that was pretty smart. <laughs> that was a pretty that was a pretty good move there, bro. For the people of this world, and here's the key, the point Jesus is making with this story, the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. Who are the people of the light? We are, right? Followers of Christ. He's saying, Jesus said, listen, people of the world are more shrewd dealing with their kind than the people of the light. I tell you, Use, world, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Jesus is saying, listen, you need to be using the resources of this world, right? For the purposes of God so that when you end up in heaven, there's going to be people there that are there because of you. You know, when I read this, I, I thought of that song, I think it was in the 90s or maybe early 2000s, uh, when something like this, thank you for giving to the Lord. I was a life that was changed. Anybody remember that song? It's a beautiful song that basically was saying, uh, he was saying, he was in heaven, he was saying thank you for giving to the Lord because what, what you gave to the Lord was used to, to get me to God. The, the things that we do for the Lord, the, the investments that we make in the things of God and, and missions and stuff. You know, as a church, I don't know if you knew that, but, but we give every month to world missions. Every month we've done that since the beginning of time. Every month we send a check uh, to support world mission, and that's all of us, because we are the ones that are, are doing this together 
as a church. And so he's saying, listen, you know, people use money here, right? The, the wealth of the world, they use it to make connections, to make moves, to make shrewd things. Well, you as a believer need to be as shrewd, but for the things of God. You know, somehow we push hard for the things of the world, but when it comes to the things of God, we, we kind of, right? Well, I don't want to push, but when you want something, you get something. But when, when it comes to the things of God, oftentimes we don't put the same effort. And Jesus isn't saying, oh, this was a good thing that the man ripped off the, you know. What he's saying is, he's looking and he's pointing out is that we need to be doing whatever we can. And we need to use the resources that God is giving us in order to further his kingdom. We need to be wise. We need to be just as shrewd. This guy was motivated, right? He was going to be out on the street. So he was motivated. He was like, you know what? I'm going to do whatever I got to do to square up. And Jesus is saying, how come we don't do that? How come we don't put that kind of focus and that kind of effort to invest in the things of God so that we can see other people coming to Christ? Verse 10 says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with little, guess what? Going to be dishonest with much. So if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who's going to trust you with true riches? Because the riches aren't the money you have here. The house, the car, the clothes, the jewelry. Those are not true riches. We've seen it throughout the book. Those are treasures built up here. Jesus keeps saying, listen, the treasure you need to be building is treasures in heaven where nobody can steal it, where it'll never disappear because guess what? One day you're going to be gone and all of that is going to be where? Here. Right? You're not taking it with you. You're not taking the, your bank account, your stocks, your car, your home. You're not taking any of it with you. But when you get there, there's going to be riches that are eternal. And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, uh, who's going to give you property of your own? One of the things I try to ingrain in people is that we don't own anything, right? If you're a follower of Christ, we say, well, it's all the Lord's. Amen. Well, it is all the Lord's. And we are stewards and we're going to give an account. So how are you managing that? Because guess what? If everything you have is based on what you want, your comfort for yourself, then you are a terrible manager. And notice what he says. Well, for that person, I'm not going to give you more. You know, when people talk about, and, and I've said this so many times, right? You hear a lot of this preaching about wealth, right? The prosperity gospel that was really hot. Uh, the 90s into 2000s, I think it's cooled down a little bit, but they're still out there, right? The more you give, the more you get. So you're really getting to give. It doesn't work that way. It's about stewardship. If you gave right now, the Bible says if you, if you give, God will give you back a hundredfold. Yeah, but if you are a waster, I don't care how much you give, God's not going to bless you. Because it's not about the gift, it's about the stewardship. That's, what, that's the part that most of these preachers, if you will, or churches that are all about the money, that's the part they leave out. Your blessing and how God will bless you financially, okay, because that's the topic right now, financially. The way God's going to bless you financially is based on your stewardship, not on how much you give. If you're giving a bunch, but you're blowing it and you're not doing anything for the Lord and, and none of the money that you have, is, it's not going to work. God, is, God wants you to be a conduit. Okay? A conduit. You know what a conduit is? Right? Those little things in the wall. Okay? The only time that I actually get the power is if I plug in it. Right? When I plug into there, the power comes through there to me. That's what God wants you to be, a conduit of blessing, a conduit of generosity. 
a conduit of you know supporting missionaries and supporting the church and and doing when you are doing those things then god looks down and goes oh man that's a faithful steward steward and see i got a faithful steward here i'm going to give him more you know what because the more I give him, the more he does. And wow, I can really trust him. And now I can bless him. And you know what? The overflow of what you get, because we never can outgive God. The overflow then, as you see in Scripture, many of the Bible greats were very rich people. So it's not about the money. God will give you all the money in the world, everything you need in abundance. In abundance. If you are a conduit of blessing. But if God gives it to you and you just store it for yourself, like the, the parable we read about the man who got that huge crop and then just built a bigger barn, just keep it in. He wasn't going to share with the poor. He wasn't going to bless anybody. No, he got greedy. And people, <laughs> nothing makes someone more greedy than getting a bunch of money. Amen? Amen. Amen. Right now, if I ask how many, if God gave you a million dollars, how many would tithe? Every hand would go up. But I guarantee you, <laughs> if you got a million dollars, are you really going to give the church a hundred grand? Uh, it's easy when you don't have it, but when that thing hits your account, all of a sudden you need to write that check. That's where God really knows your heart. And, and the reason a lot of people don't, aren't blessed financially is because God knows them. That's why when the rich young ruler came to God and said, oh, you know, I, I want to do everything. I, I've, been, I've been just. I follow the laws. I do everything. You know, I want to follow you. And Jesus said, okay, great. Get rid of your money. Come on. Oh, and the guy's like, what? Oh, no. Can't do that. Well, Matthew was rich, and Jesus never asked Matthew to give up his money. Why? Because it wasn't a problem. Matthew wasn't consumed with that. And so if, you're, if God can't trust you with the little things, how is he going to trust you with real things, with eternal lives? And he says, he says in verse 13, he says, No one can serve two masters. Either you hate one or love the other. Devoted to one, despise the other. You can't serve God and money. And for many people, money is their God. Right? How do you know? How do you know if God is your Lord or money is your Lord? Very simple test. We could all try it out. Ready? Give a, give a check, give an amount that you know is way above what you can afford. You're going to have one of two reactions. A, might be scary, but you're going to feel good about yourself. Damn, I just blessed. I, I can't even afford this. But my gosh, I just blessed somebody. Or you're going to be angry. You're going to kick yourself for having done it. You're going to look, you're going to be worried. Am I going to be able to buy groceries this week? That's how you know which one's your God. Because if God is your God, then you're not going to worry about it because God says, I will supply all your needs according to my riches and glory. I will supply your needs. You, you cannot outgive me. But if money is your God, you're going to be all upset. You're going to be, all right? What I love is with couples, that the other one, the one that doesn't want to give let the other one give a lot and see how the, the other spouse, or the other person reacts to it. Mm. I'll be honest, when we first tith started tithing, Mary was a lot more than I was. I tolerated it. <laughs> She's always been very giving in the very beginning, but I just, I, I just knew, okay, we got to do this. But oh my gosh, it hurt. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, 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 Come on, people. It was like, oh, okay, okay. But then throughout, over time, I realized it ain't mine. What am I doing? What do I carry? And God has supplied all of our needs throughout. We have never been in need. Even when we had nothing, we never went without it. You're either going to love money or, and that's always going to be that, that, okay? Because we take possession of it. And he says in verse 14, the Pharisees, they love money. 
And then when they heard this, they sneered at Jesus, right? And, and people will do that all the time. You, you, you know, the worst topic in church, about money. Oh, it's about money. I'm out of here, right? And that's what they did. Why? Because they love money. He said to them, you know, you're the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your heart. What people value highly is detestable to God. The things that, that we often value and the, the, what's important in this world, God looks at it, and, and the word used there is a strong one, detestable. Detestable. That's the same word he used back in Deuteronomy when he talked about witchcraft, tarot cards, astrology, those things. 5,000 years ago, God said, those things to me are detestable. Don't mess with them. Don't touch them. Don't go there. If you're a Christ follower and you're looking at your horoscope or going to a medium or doing some of that stuff, understand that God really hates this. And then he tells the story of this rich man and Lazarus. Right? So you got Lazarus who's... Uh, Poor man, a sick man, and he every day he'd go out and, and sit over by the table where the rich man was. Rich man, fine clothes, you know, they talked about the purples and the reds and those things. I mean, to have a, 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 a garment of purple in those days, that was expensive stuff because those dyes were rare. Okay? So this was big money. This guy had big money. And he would see the poor guy over there laying there hungry. And the guy wouldn't even give him crumbs off his table. He could care less about this guy. And, and Jesus says, you know, the time came in verse 22 when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham side and the rich man also died and was buried. You know one of the things that we all know? You are going to die. No exceptions to the rule. For all his sin comes short of the glory of God, we all will die one day. And so the beggar died, and guess what? The rich man with all his riches, he dies too, and they both end up, but they end up in different places. Right? The rich guy in Hades was in torment. And he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. And so he called him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip his finger in the water to cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. So he, he, he's in hell and he looks over and he sees Abraham and he sees Lazarus next to him. And uh, I love it because he goes, hey, hey, send, you know, that that's the poor guy. Yeah, send him to dip his finger. Give me some water. <laughs> he, he still thinks he's above it, right? He's, th he's still thinking he's all that. He's still wanting to command poor Lazarus, you go and do this for me. But Abraham replied, yo, dude. You remember that in your lifetime you received good things while Lazarus received bad things? But now he's comforted here and you're in agony. Besides all this, between us, there's a great chasm that has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to there cannot, and you cannot cross over from here to us. In other words, this is it. There is heaven and there is hell. And if you end up in heaven, you're in heaven forever. You end up in hell, you're in hell forever. There is no crossing over. There is no way to get around it. He said, listen, you had all these good things during the, on earth. Lazarus, not so good. But now, guess what? The things have been reversed. As I, as I read that, I, I was thinking, you know, there are times, can you think of a time that you were, you really had a great, great time? Something in your life, a period in your life that was just awesome, right? Just take a second, think about it. The best time in your life that you can think of, 
the best, best time. Whenever that was and whatever that was, it was a short day of life. You know that eternity is for a long time? It's kind of, again, it's kind of like when I go in the coal plunge, right? It's kind of like hell. <laughs> but the way I rationalize it in my head is I, I'm, I'm thinking it's only seven minutes. It's only seven minutes. I can do anything for seven minutes, right? So I'm able to go in and, and just suffer because it's only seven minutes and I'm done. The Bible is clear that our life here on earth is like a blink of an eye. I mean, only yesterday I was like 20. And in about two minutes, I'm going to be 90. Okay? That's how fast. But eternity is forever. And eternity counts so much more. See, the, the things that we invest for eternity will be with us forever. The things that we invest here on earth, they come and go. They come and go. No matter how beautiful your car is 10 years from now, it ain't so beautiful. Amen? No matter how wonderful those clothes are, they're not going to fit in five years. <laughs> Hello, am I preaching this morning? Jesus then says, look, the rich man then says, look, I beg you, send, send Lazarus to my brothers, right? Because they are as bad as I am, right? They're greedy, they're selfish, uh, they don't want to have anything to do with God because, you know, their lives are wonderful, they've got it all, they're in control. But send Lazarus because, you know, they see a dead person, uh, that'll shake them up, that'll wake them up. We definitely don't want him to come into this place of torment. But Abraham replies, you know what? They've got Moses and the prophet. Let them listen to them. I would say, he would say today, he would say, you know what? You've got the word of God. You've got the life of Christ. You've got to listen to that. If they didn't listen to Moses and the prophets, they're not going to be convinced, even if someone is raised from the dead. Christ himself was raised from the dead. There are people today that will not listen, that aren't going to accept it. But our job, our responsibility as stewards of not only what God gives us, but also of the word of God, as stewards, we are to go out. And we need to be generous both with our resources, with our knowledge. Be generous with God's word. You know, how often do we have a, a word from God, but then we're like, oh, but, you know, they don't like religion around here. Or, you know, they don't like you to talk about God. And we don't. We got to be like that shrewd manager said, you know what? I got to do whatever it takes. The whole point of this chapter is Jesus saying is, listen, God's going to bless you, but, but, you have, but you're going to give an account. And the more you do for God, the more God will bless you. And we need to understand that the time is at hand. Uh, you know, the things are getting darker and darker, quicker and quicker. And God has called you and he's called me, he's called us to get the word out. And sometimes people will listen through our generosity and our love, right? Had this rich guy been generous to Lazarus, perhaps God would have looked at him differently. Not that we can work our way to heaven because obviously it's through faith only. But we are to be a generous people. We ought to be concerned about the poor, about the needy, about the widows, but the orphans. And we are called to give our resources. That's why I'm, I'm proud of our church. I, I think we're going to have an announcement pretty soon about where we're at with, with these gifts for the children. But it's our responsibility. 
It really is. And that's why, again, that's why Jesus brought it up so many times. Because if we're not careful, the things of this world will corrupt us. And we will be saved and we'll end up in heaven, but we would have wasted all our time here on earth. So let us, as individuals and as a church, be as shrewd as this guy was with the things of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we are thankful for the word and for all your blessings, Lord. Lord, you have called us, and Lord, help us to be good stewards of everything you've given us. Our time, our resources, our riches, our talents, the very knowledge that we have in our brains, Lord. Help us, Lord, to do all things for your name's sake. What's in your name that we pray? And everybody said? Amen. Amen, amen. amen.